Welcome. So on behalf of the Florida Department of Health in Volusia County, welcome to the 2021 Path for Hope Virtual Summit. I uh, have joined the Harm Reduction Interactive Discussion. My name is Jordan Holly, and I'll be facilitating this session. Um, we're having some technical di difficulties with the subject matter experts, but when they come on, we'll more than welcome pass it over to them. There'll be Kyle McDonald and Renee Nicholas, who will be the subject matter experts for this session. Um, but because this is an interactive dialogue, I think we can still hit the questions and come up with some really good information on this subject amongst us, and I'm excited to hear from everybody. Um, please keep your microphones on mute until you're recognized to speak. Uh, raise your hand to be recognized and participate in this discussion. You may also submit any questions or comments in the chat feature, and I can read them out loud. Um, you're invited to turn your cameras on for this session. And a big thank you to the Path for Hope Summit Planning Committee partners, uh, Advent Health, Community Coalition Alliance, One Voice for Volusia, SMA Healthcare, and the Volusia Recovery Alliance. Um, I do have several questions to promote the discussion, um, but we're going to kind of, you know, follow the conversation and see where it takes us. Um, the first question that we have here is, you know, what are some examples of, oh, I see Kyle McDonald. Look at that, we've got him on. <laughs> hey, um, sorry folks. Um, I'm just, I'm calling him from my phone cause I'm at the office and anyway, um, and it looks like I'm gonna have a different colleague joining a colleague, Noah, um, who works with Renee. Uh, so I don't think Renee will be able to make it. Um, but happy to be here um, and, and definitely happy to get started. Um, so thank you so much, Jordan, for facilitating. Um, should I, let's see, so I can see there's 18 of us in the room and it looks like Noah is just joining now, which is great. Um, and I guess whenever um, he is here as well, then maybe we can do some introductions, I guess. Um, so let's see. Sure, we just had in the chat and I think it's a great idea. Can we have everybody drop their names and organizations in the chat so we know who's here? Awesome. Oh, yay, Lynn Kennedy's here. Hey, Lynn, let's see you there. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and I see that Noah was able to join. Thanks so much, Noah. Um, and, oh, Marisol is here. Oh, there's lots of people, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so for folks who don't know me, my name's Dr. Kyle McDonald. I'm a pediatric and public health physician based in New York City. And I lead a CDC grant funded uh, technical assistance team uh, that provides TA to health departments across the country, including Volusia County on the opioid overdose crisis. Um, and I was really lucky to get to be a presenter uh, yesterday morning um, for a session on drug policy in Canada versus the US, which was really, really fun. Um, and happy to be invited to come answer some questions in this space. Um, and if this is an okay time, I'll pass it to Noah so, so he can introduce himself as well. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Noah. I go by he, him, his pronouns. And um, I am a field responder in, at, in the um, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Bureau of Alcohol and Drug Use Prevention Care and Treatment on the Rapid Assessment and Response Team. Sorry, that was a mouthful. That was awesome. Thank you, Noah. Yeah, for any, for folks, I'm sure for a lot of people, especially if you're based at um, health departments or things, like ours certainly has a lot of very long acronyms. Um, and, and I'm in a room by myself, so I can take this off. Um, so perfect. So um, Jordan, how does this session work? I'll turn it over to you. Oh, and you're on mute. Uh, thank you. Yeah. For right now, everybody's been invited to, you know, turn their cameras off. I mean, on, not off. <laughs> turn your cameras on and um, enter any questions that we may have in the chat box. Um, and, and then I'll read them out loud to you so that we can get them answered. Um, you can also raise your hand if you want to be recognized to ask a question. 
Um, and I, I'd like to start start the conversation maybe with um, what are some examples of harm reduction? Great, awesome. Um, I'm, I definitely don't have to go first, um, but I don't mind getting started. Um, so when I think of harm reduction, I think it's important to know some of the history of it, that really it comes from a movement um, driven by people who use drugs um, and, and advocates in the community of trying to, um, yeah, protect everyone, keep folks safe. Um, and support each other and harm reduction strategies and approaches have been around for decades, but it's unfortunately more of a recent phenomenon that health departments are, are really trying to advance these issues, but I, I just want to um, level set that harm reduction really is is an advocacy based movement that comes from the grassroots community um, of promoting safety and, and health practices um, with folks who are using drugs. Um, with that said, today, often whenever I think of harm reduction, at least, um, I think of a series of strategies, policies, services, programs, um, and materials and information that can all help people to use um, the substances that they're using in, in a safer way and helping to literally prevent harms, whether that's preventing the harms of contracting um, a, a viral or bacterial illness um, or other kinds of injuries, um, or of course, hopefully preventing overdose and death. Um, but there's a, a lot to harm reduction. It, it's definitely a huge area um, and something that we talk a lot about, um, but it's, it's like very diverse and depends on the population that you're working with. Um, and the legal framework of where you're working, especially coming from a health department, what we're able to provide or can't provide really depends on the jurisdiction. Um, Noah, do you wanna expand a bit more on, on harm reduction? Noah, like for, um, I don't wanna put Noah on the spot too much because he literally just finished presenting um, this morning on a super cool project in New York City uh, focused on people who inject drugs, especially in the um, Puerto Rican community in New York. Um, and partnering with uh, people based in the community um, uh, who are vein finding doctors uh, called Gancheros, um, which was super cool. But Sonoa literally just presented for almost an hour. <laughs> um, so with that like context, um, and I'm so grateful that he's here. Um, no, what do you want to add about harm reduction? Um, I think Kyle had a pretty good sum summary of it. Um, in the more literal sense of harm reduction, I think it just is a pragmatic strategy of reducing the, how do you say, the impact of an, I guess, of a risk that might be inev inevitable for a particular individual. So like a seatbelt, for example, could be harm reduction in terms of like the inevitable risk that comes with driving a car and preventing the severity of the impact of like an accident, for example. But in a more, I guess, historical framework like as Kyle referenced it, it a lot of it has to do with like changing the narrative of like the communal harms that marginalized populations experience as like primarily institutional rather than due to like individual behavior and it kind of looks at like what type of I guess interventions that the communities present to themselves or that they you know find for themselves that can be elevated or effective um, and as Kyle said it does like the history of harm reduction as we know it in like post 80s <laughs> is like heavily influenced by communities whose I guess lives were prescribed as like socially deviant or illegal such as people who practice sex work or use drugs as examples so a lot of the harms that are associated with you know like those I guess communities and the interventions that we know today it's sort of come it's rooted in that I guess struggle or practice. And I think it's interesting that a lot of harms that we try and produce are harms that are structural and often comes from other parts of the same government uh, that is also trying to reduce harm. So a lot of the criminalization of drugs results in unsafe conditions for folks to use. And then we often, whether it's, you know, in health departments or other areas, are trying to support or offset or pick up the pieces of problems that are really not inherent to the drug itself, 
but if you make you know hypodermic needles uh, illegal or punishable um, or fentanyl test strips or we take away tools um, that folks could use to be able to use more safely then we as you know, as you know, members of, of government or organizations um, in power often create the very same like risky, unsafe conditions, but then other folks like us are also trying to resolve. Um, so I just want to also highlight that a lot of the risks are not inherent to the drug itself, but it's related to the you know structural, political. Um, and legal environment that folks using drugs are operating within, which um, is is um, something that was you know made by people and and can be changed by people. So I do draw um, hope in that. Does anybody else have any comments or questions on this topic? I'd like to um, just kind of chime in a little bit. Oh, wait, I'll see, I see Lynn's hand. I'm gonna let Lynn talk and then I'll chime in. I can't wait to hear you chime in. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> I wanted to mention um, syringe service programs because that's on my mind because we don't have that here in Volusia County. And it's something that's of interest that I want to learn more about and see how we can make that change. And I know things are happening across Florida and I was happy to hear from other um, presentations during the summit about those activities. So I think um, I think that's one you asked for examples, and that's one example that came to mind for me because I would like to know more about it and and how um, how to how to implement it, advocate for it, um, those types of information. And Kyle, I really appreciate the fact that you talked about this historically being coming from a community of advocacy. I think that really helps um, helps with that narrative. Thank you. I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> that sounds like a really worthy endeavor. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think something like syringe service programs here in, in New York City, there's there's multiple programs and that have been around for a, a long, long time. And, and certainly at the health department, we have a long history of collaborating with on a whole host of, of initiatives. Um, but Volusia County is not unique in not having syringe service programs. Um, it's something I wish was available in every county and for because there's folks who use drugs in every county of the country and we should have services for them. Um, and I, I do know too that um, they, there are some in Florida, um, which suggests that at the state level, they are permissible, um, but often, you know, requires county, you know, level changes in bylaws, um, which is pretty interesting. But um, Noah, you would, you would definitely work more closely with SSPs than me. Do you feel um, comfortable speaking a bit about SSPs in New York, kind of what the landscape is like for them? Um, yeah, um, in in New York State, since 1992, syringe access, you know, through a public health statute has been, you know what I mean, somewhat authorized, and communities of people who use drugs who had been distributing the materials had, you know what I mean, continually protested, or like, like place like jars of like, use syringes in front of like state health departments until they were allowed to like, practice as they saw fit, which is a very different dynamic than like, in Louisiana in 2018, where I went and like it was still very underground and like communities were sort of distributing like donated syringes that had been expired from other programs like ours. So I would say that um, in New York City, like because of that particular, I guess because of that hi particular historical milestone, like there's some, you know what I mean, some, I guess, decades of like work to build off of. I would say a lot of the struggles have to do with gentrification and dis displacement of the communities of drugs that the um, that New York City um, certain service programs serve, mainly due to how encampments are criminalized or loitering in public is criminalized. There's also um, the high cost of rent that affects certain service programs that are continually displaced because of like, you know, like their their current living residential situation. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of like unique, I guess, barriers to operating in New York City. If that makes sense, I don't know if that answered your question. 
Yeah, and could you expand a little bit on the kind of services that people might be able to expect if they went to a syringe service program in New York, just for folks who've never been to one before? Yeah. Um, it depends a lot on what threshold of service you're seeking. Um, a lot of the services are obviously anonymous. Um, SSPs um, service uh, communities through Walkabout often, which is like, you know, trusted uh, health promoters are people who come from backgrounds of people who use drugs, like um, having a particular outreach route. It might involve going into shooting galleries. It might involve going into areas where public injection happens. And that's sort of like, so there's that like aspect of it. A lot of programs have mobile van outreach in high impact areas. They also tend to have storefront offices where you can um, collect uh, sharps and dis dispense new ones on site. And those are often opportunities for engagement for, I guess, quote unquote, higher threshold services. And those might include um, rapid testing for HIV, um, hepatitis C, viral hepatitis. Um, some, some SSPs now have co-located medical services that would be pertinent to people who use drugs, such as, um, you know, like vein care, wound care, um, like types of services or cultural competency that um, you wouldn't necessarily get in a traditional medical setting that might be more stigmatizing to that community. And some even uh, programs also have grants for like patient navigation services, case management, um, care coordination, things of that nature. And depending on how well-funded or what your infrastructure looks like, you a lot of um, SSPs have robust drop-in centers where people can have like a respite space to just kind of hang out. They may have showers, they might have laundry, there might be meals offered, stuff like that. It's kind of like a community safe haven in many cases. Yeah, so definitely can be very comprehensive and there's, there's you know, certainly over a, a, a dozen, you know, SSPs that we work with, the varying degrees that there's, there's quite a number across the city. Um, and I think it's interesting to see too where some services are going. I think um, we're very slowly trying to expand um, access to drug testing um, equipment. So fentanyl test strips um, are, is one example, um, but the city through the health department is also working to acquire drug checking machines um, that use just like a small amount of drugs to be able to test to see what's actually inside. Um, something else too that we're working on hopefully for um, 2022 is collaborating with syringe service programs as well as some um, other overdose um, programs around having uh, what we call harm reduction vending machines that would have supplies. So through an SSP, a syringe service program, it would be like a vending machine that would have um, supplies needed for um, safer injection, including things like it could be, you know, syringes or alcohol swabs or a tourniquet or kind of a variety, wide variety of equipment. And hopefully those machines will be able to include other um, harm reduction tools as well, whether it's related to um, contraception or, or other areas um, or, or safer inhalation of drugs um, or smoking of drugs. Um, but so that's kind of a, an upcoming partnership that we're working in the health department to roll out in partnership with syringe service programs and others just to kind of continuously expand the hours of access, um, the range of services that are available. But like Noah said, especially in a market like New York City where um, populations are constantly shifting, especially due to gentrification and high costs of housing and neighborhoods will be rezoned and a lot of new development can come in and really displace folks. So it can be um, very challenging whenever the neighborhoods continue to evolve. I love the idea of a vending machine that takes away the fear from the people that would be going to go use it and talking with people. Um, we have Tim that had his hand raised and then Lynn had her hand raised. Good afternoon, hi, uh, my name is Tim Santra. I'm executive director of Florida Harm Reduction Collective and Kyle and Noah, we probably know a lot of the same people. I spent 25 years in New York City doing harm reduction needle exchange work, uh, including on, I uh, know I love that you use the term walkabout. Uh, my every Saturday was spent at the Lower East Side walkabout. Um, 
walking the streets uh, at Ludlow and Delancey and, and such uh, doing syringe exchange. But um, so Florida Harm Reduction Collective, we're actually funded to help counties uh, and organizations within counties get syringe access programs up and running. Uh, we work in partnership with IDEA Miami uh, and the other IDEA programs is IDEA Orlando, Tampa, um, and then uh, other organizations, Rebel Recovery or Flash Exchange in West Palm Beach and The Spot in Broward County, which just opened recently, our most recent uh, uh, needle exchange in the state. Um, we're also working with, I think it's either nine or 11 other counties or organizations, Nassau, Duval, Brevard, Flagler, Pinellas, Leon, Alachua, uh, Pasco, um, so, so if you're with an organization or a county and you want syringe exchange there, please uh, contact me. I'll drop my uh, email in the chat um, because we're certainly here to help. Um, you know, and I, I, I get excited and nostalgic hearing about New York because I know the programs are, my first needle exchange was in Buffalo in 1991. We were underground. Um, but um, the big barrier for, for us in Florida is uh, no state, county, or municipal funds can be used to support syringe access programs. And that includes uh, federal pass-through dollars. So even if SAMHSA or the CDC says you can spend this money on needles, uh, Florida says you can't. Um, so that's one of our hurdles. And it's something as a state that we're going to have to address um, moving forward. Um, there are other ways to fund syringe access programs um, using 340B money. If you uh, have a pharmacy and you're getting, and, and pardon my words on this, but if you're getting a kickback from the pharmacy company, pharmaceutical companies, you can use that money to buy syringes. And there are other direct grants um, that can go for funding them. But um, there are also, uh, I would say, eight to 10 underground exchanges uh, going on in Florida. Um, everywhere from the Panhandle to uh, Key West. Um, and, and harm reduction has a long history in Florida. Um, you know, so, so I encourage folks to reach out and, 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 and you know, I can talk, I can talk for hours about this stuff. Um, you know, it's been my life work for 30 years. So, um, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Tim, for speaking. That's absolutely incredible. Um, and thank, yeah, thank you for all the work that you've obviously been a part of in New York City and then are continuing to push in Florida in spite of tremendous structural barriers. Um, that's incredible. Yes, thank you. I will be following up with you. <laughs> and thank you, Noah, because you gave me an idea of a new partner to contact. So I really appreciate your description because within that, I was like, wait a minute, I just heard something new. And so, so thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Tim, for that historical and like um, present context of what y'all are dealing with. Um, more power to you. <laughs> oh yeah, um, SWP and IDR Orlando are doing vending machines. Yeah, that's really, that's really awesome. And it's not, yeah. New York City will not be the first jurisdiction to do this. It, it's existed in like Vegas and Seattle already. Like we're, yeah, we're like New York City Council is a little bit late to the game, but that's okay. That's been pretty typical with this administration, unfortunately. Uh, so where, oh, oh yeah, no, go Sorry. ahead, Jordan. No, go ahead, because I was going to ask if we had any other questions or comments. So if you were talking, then we do. I, I was just going to ask, um, I was curious, where does it look like things will evolve next in Florida? Like what initiative is kind of closest to, to reality as far as advancing harm reduction? Is it um, delisting some products as, as drug paraphernalia? Is it a funding change? Is it maybe um, more support for peers or other health services? What do folks think is kind of uh, on the horizon for, for whether it's like legal or legislative changes in Florida that could help expand harm reduction services. Tim shaking his head, nothing.
Go ahead, Tim. Uh, I see your hand. So, so I think you know what we've got to look forward to in Florida. We, we're, we're probably not going to get a chance to go back to the legislature to get a change in the Infectious Disease Elimination Act for maybe another two or three years. Um, the 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 kind of uh, political will isn't there yet to not wait to see what happens as far as funding and paraphernalia laws um, until, until they've got a little bit more experience with uh, more syringe access programs in different parts of the state, um, which has been one of our strategies at the collective is supporting um, some rural exchanges. Hopefully Nassau County uh, will come up within the next year or so. There's a lot of interest there. Um, there's also interest in Ocala, um, in Marion County. Um, so, you know, I think that that's what's on the horizon for us is with it, that we're going to see a, a great expansion of syringe access programs. Will they be the most accessible programs? Um, that's going to depend on um, each county. Uh, counties are able to sort of dictate to uh, programs receiving authorization how those programs operate. So, um, you know, in, in, in Duval, we're, we're probably, we will probably be the next, I, I, I live in, in St. Augustine um, and, and work with folks in Duval County very closely. Duval will probably be the next county to pass an ordinance, yeah, fingers crossed. Um, it, it's moving through the, the county commission now, um, but they only want a fixed site. They don't want a mobile site, um, you know, so that's gonna be access, that's gonna be difficult in a city like Jacksonville, which is so spread out and doesn't have a lot of transportation um, to get folks around. Um, so I think that the, you know what, what we'll see over the next year or two is expansion of programs linked to already existing medical and or HIV AIDS service organizations. Um, and, and, and then uh, what, we're, what we will have to look at is how do we then kind of diffuse the concentration within organizations to the streets, um, to you know, in rural areas, uh, to shooting galleries and, and trap houses, um, how do we how do we funnel down into those areas uh, so that we're actually reaching people not you know physically where they're at as opposed to where they're at in their substance use? Um, yeah, I don't I don't hold any hope that we'll see a change in the paraphernalia law around syringes. Um, there's just too much pushback against that within the legislature. Um, you know, we may not even get fentanyl strips removed from paraphernalia right now, fentanyl strips of paraphernalia, although I'll say from my experience, fentanyl strips in Florida are useless. All of our opioids have fentanyl in it um, and using fentanyl strips for stimulants and things like that is so unreliable that um, I, we don't suggest that users use fentanyl strips uh, for, for meth in Florida. It's just too difficult for them to the process is just too difficult for them to use it. So I, I definitely appreciate that. And this, this might surprise folks. I was surprised to learn this just a few years ago, but up until like we just got an email this week that the governor in New York signed a bill to decriminalize the possession and sale of hypodermic needles and syringes. Um, so up until like this week, that was actually still on the books in New York state as illegal, which I found shocking. I guess for years, um, at least within the jurisdiction of New York City, um, there was some sort of agreement with the DA that um, our, the NYPD wouldn't go after um, folks, um, ideally, um, although there is still a lot of harassment around folks who use drugs in all kinds of ways, um, but ideally folks um, under that kind of agreement, folks wouldn't be prosecuted for possession of syringes, but but yeah, like I said, it was only this week that the governor actually signed a bill to decriminalize that. Um, so there's there's a lot of of laws on the books that it's just like people don't even necessarily know because drug criminalization is just rooted in so many different pieces of legislation and administrative ordinances and regulations. 
Um, oh, okay, residue laws I see are a huge barrier in Florida. So, and, and residue laws, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're referring to like if a syringe is found with any residue of drug in it, then you're charged for possessing that substance. Okay, yeah, I see Tim nodding. And I was curious too, if folks have thoughts or ideas around this. Um, one thing I found interesting just with different health departments and jurisdictions of the country is the impact of Medicaid expansion or the lack thereof through the ACA and how that affects access to uh, treatment in particular, but other areas. Um, I'd be interested to hear from folks on um, thoughts of uh, the impact if Medicaid was expanded in Florida and if uh, in a number of especially more red states, it, it's been citizens initiatives around um, referendums and things that have really forced governors in some states to um, advance. Uh, or accept funding, the very generous funding through the HCA. Um, but I'd be curious to hear more from folks on the ground in Florida um, around that and how that uh, could play into harm reduction in the state. Does anybody have anything to, to add to that? I'm also interested. Tim has his hand raised. Go ahead, Tim. I'm going to end up talking a lot just because we're involved in all this. So Medicaid expansion will not happen under the current administration. Um, they have he has basically said, no, it will not happen. And, and if he did pass it, it would undermine the, the kind of Republican base. Um, in Florida, the feeling is he will run for president in 2024. Um, but if if Chris wins uh, the governorship, uh, it probably will happen. Um, he's going to make that part of his platform moving forward. And, um, you know, um, I think it would be we can look to states like Kentucky to, to see how well Medicaid expansion has worked for folks using drugs. Um, access to treatment uh, has to, an MAT, uh, even abstinence based treatment, access to housing. Every aspect of, of a drug user's life has been addressed by Medicaid expansion in a positive way, um, you know, and hopefully it will happen um, someday for us. Um, but um, yeah. Thank you. And in the that, chat, so. Vanessa had um, mentioned, and I think it goes, falls right with, you know, it's a great solution you know, doing the comparative data from similar states that had expanded compared to Florida, who has not expanded. Yeah, Vanessa, would you mind speaking a little bit more about that? We'd love to hear, you know, more voices in the room, but you absolutely don't have to. Yeah, definitely. I don't mind. Um, we were, we meet often as community agencies, like we come together with Tim and we have an organization in Duval called Drug Free Duval who helps our OD2A program to identify gaps. And then they apply for like innovative projects and things like that. And so that was one gap that we kind of talked about recently is a treatment gap. Mainly we focused on um, when in treatment, a lot of times the focus is one um, condition. It's, you know, either mental health or substance use disorder, but we know that treating both will have the best outcome. So we've talked a lot about that in terms of um, how can we you know, improve that? But one of the methods to kind of like, you know, supporting it was looking at like Medicaid expansion data, um, kind of just trying to see, you know, how can we improve here in Florida to, you know, just promote better access to treatment essentially. We haven't gotten too Definitely. far yet though. <laughs> No, that sounds like a really fantastic initiative. Um, my research is with buprenorphine, and it's been definitely interesting talking with folks um, in different states, uh, either that hadn't expanded Medicaid and then and then did later in the impact of that, or states that still hadn't, like the conversations with partners in Florida. And they're there's so many doctors and healthcare providers who are like, yeah, it's just like not really worth it, like for the reimbursement. And it's just, I find it so infuriating um, 
that it's something like it really shows like you follow the money and money really shows people's priorities and just how little we value um, the treatment of addiction as, as a healthcare system. Um, and the ACA, you know, doesn't solve everything, um, but certainly advances a lot of supports in a lot of areas. And I can understand that, you know, for busy providers, especially where stigma uh, around people who use drugs is just so embedded in the medical system, as well as just the communities that we live in. If you're not going to be reimbursed much for it, and there's already so much stigma, I can see why a lot of providers just kind of avoid it, which is just so tragic um, and unfair, but is, is again, like something that's structural that we had, do have the power to change. Um, and so I think that is super cool if you're able to compare with other jurisdictions and kind of see um, what's happening because yeah, it's, it, it is hard though. And I wonder if this is something you all encounter a lot, but a lot of the um, decisions I find, and this is coming from someone who doesn't live in Florida, but a lot of decisions seem to be very ideological based and not evidence based. And so I feel like, especially as, you know, as scientists and public health professionals and things like we want to find the data and the evidence under the assumption that decision makers would say, aha, look, of course, this would save money or advance, you know, life expectancy or quality of life or all of these things. But if the folks on the other side of the table are not thinking based off of evidence or the same metrics as we are, they're looking at, you know, punishment or morality. Um, it, it's, you know, we're really talking past each other, which is so challenging. I'd be interested if that kind of resonates with folks at all. Yeah, definitely. And just a follow-up comment as well. Like I think, like you said, data is a lot of times a driver for change. Um, we do have a partner here in Florida, um, Project Opioid, who in their phase two of their program, of their project and grant and things like that, they're gonna be doing a community needs assessment on treatment availability. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, what they find in that, because I think it will really show like, where do we need to kind of like improve our access to treatment and just like availability and things like that. Maybe it would encourage some providers to um, offer that service. Lynn also has her hand raised. Thank you. Um, I think we might have a better opportunity working with our local officials than the state level officials. And I'll say that being one who does not work <clears throat> with the state level officials, so I could be entirely wrong about that. But I just think that um, when you talk about evidence-based, I think of the county health rankings and the counties like to talk about those county health rankings and being higher in the rankings. So having um, longevity, life longevity, you know, and avoiding um, early death. And I think those types of things affect that overall county health ranking. So I think those um, topics are, are up for discussion more with local policymakers. That's really exciting. Um, and that reminds me, so uh, last year I read uh, a really great book by Ezra Klein uh, called Why We're Polarized, focused on polarization of politics. And a big takeaway that I took from that book is just with the continued nationalization of politics, we spend so much time talking, especially at the national level or even at the state level. But if you look across the country, there's only a few hundred people in Congress, but there's thousands and thousands of local policymakers and decision makers who make decisions that affect our everyday lives in so many different areas. But it's like 90% of the media coverage and conversation is focused on a couple hundred people, even though there's thousands and thousands of policymakers, decision makers at city, county, and, and you know, state level um, as well. And oftentimes those people are a lot more accessible, a lot easier to phone up their office and get a meeting with them. Like I couldn't just like 
call up my, you know, this a senator for New York, like Chuck Schumer, and get a meeting with him. But like, I could probably meet maybe with my city councilor, um, or maybe someone in in the borough or county that I live in in Queens. Um, and so I think those folks are often overlooked, but are generally more accessible and and do have a lot of decision making power and influence. And oftentimes, people in politics might start at the local level and kind of work their way up. And so I think it's also an opportunity that, you know, if that person has aspirations for a higher office, um, being influenced, um, you know, by a public health approach and harm reduction, maybe that's something that they will take with them if they were seeking, you know, like a mayoralty or, or, or like a state, um, you know, role. And so I think it's so, so important that we don't lose sight of the opportunities for advancement and change at the local level. So thank you so much, Lynn, for, for really kind of centering that because I, I feel like I overlook that so often and, and it's super important. I have to say, I love how this conversation has kind of hit all the questions that I had to ask, you know, without even asking the questions, it's great. Um, and Vanessa put in the chat, media is maybe framing policy change as inaccessible. Yeah, and I think too, just with like a polarized political environment, it becomes like, well, if one group is for it, the other group has to be against it. And fortunately, local level politics is, is, not, is not always, but often not quite as vitriolic or um, aggressively partisan. And if you're able to, get in a room with folks and kind of build relationships over time, I think it can be really impactful. Lynn has her hand raised. Well, I would really like to invite all of the other participants in this conversation to enter into the chat or raise your hand about whether or not your perspective on harm reduction has changed or been strengthened by any of the sessions you've attended during the past two days. Um, I know there have been a, a few presentations that have really given out a lot of information. And I was just wondering if it has um, either strengthened the perspective you already had or and made you feel more confident about advocating or if it changed your perspective um, one way or the other. So just a chat, even a thumbs up, even if you just want to do a reaction with a thumbs up, that, that would be great. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. And I also wanted to acknowledge too, so because I'm calling in from my phone, I can only see like so many boxes at a time, but I do see that uh, a fantastic colleague of, of ours, Renee Nicholas has joined. Um, so Renee, for all I know, you've been here for ages and I just needed to Skype over, um, but I wanted to welcome you and um, give you, you know, just some space to be able to introduce yourself if you'd like and, and maybe um, reflect anything you would like, you know, in this harm reduction, just, you know, space that we're creating together. Uh -huh. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so as Kyle said, my name is Renee, uh, Renee Nicholas. I'm a field researcher with the Rapid Assessment and Response Team. So I work really closely with NOAA. Um, I've been in this role for about four years, initially started as a field responder. Um, uh, and just about a year ago, I moved into this newer role. I've been working in harm reduction for about oh, like nine years or so, nine or 10 years. I uh, started in Washington, DC, volunteering with HIPS, which is a syringe service program there. Um, and then uh, got my master's and moved to New York City to continue my harm reduction work. And I think, you know, harm reduction just has a really special place in my life. Um, you know, and the, the lives of a lot of people that I care deeply about. And it, it, it has provided me this drive um, to, to really do this hard work. Um, and I think harm reduction, something that I, I want people to remember is that um, harm reduction can be applied for to any single part of your life. You know, people say like, Pub, you know, everything is public health, but like, you know, everything can be harm reduction and like trying to minimize harms of, you know, the pandemic. Uh, there's many harm reduction techniques that you can take. Um, 
And the last thing that I want to say is um, after working in the Bronx for a really long time, uh, so for four years, I've realized that, you know, a lot of people just don't have the language for this. Um, and, and so that's something that we've been working to um, improve on, uh, and on our team is that, you know, particularly in the Bronx, this, this epidemic has been an issue for, for decades, um, and we've addressed it uh, through, through policing. And we're still seeing the Bronx with some of the highest rates of overdose across the country, if not the world. Um, and uh, I've worked with many public housing residents who um, are seeing a lot of syringe litter, a lot of public drug use around their home, around their kids, on their rooftops, in their elevators, and it's really disruptive to their lives. Uh, and, and one tenant association president, she said, you know, they need those people, so she was othering, but she said those people need a place um, at Lincoln Hospital, which is right across the street, where they can go do their thing. And what is that? That's overdose prevention centers, that's safe consumption spaces, but she just didn't have the language to communicate what she wanted, um, but she did want to do something more compassionate than just, um, and more effective than just, you know, arresting her community members. So yeah, if anybody has any questions or, but that's all I wanted to share. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, there's, you know, there's some comments in the chat, but I really liked what you had to sh uh, say about harm reduction being part of like all of your life. Um, because I really think one of the biggest tools in harm reduction is just, and you don't have to worry about any um, policies needing to be changed over it, but just meeting people where they're at, um, which falls into stigma and such. Um, but meeting people where they're at so that a seed can be planted in the first place, you know? So that was awesome to hear you share. Um, I want to point out in the chat, we've got um, Leanne had said that the presentations have strengthened the view that she had already. Um, and Alexandria said that it's been really enlightening to hear from North and Central Florida and what is going on there for me, who is located in South Florida. It really gives a more full picture of what is happening all over the state. Um, and then Vanessa put her contact information in the chat if anyone's interested in reaching out. It's right, her email is right there. And then Tim put in the chat, what more do folks want to see as far as information on harm reduction? I see your hand, Tim, go ahead. So the reason I asked that question is, is uh, Florida Harm Reduction Collective has had already done uh, one series of, of uh, webinars with, in a partnership with National Harm Reduction Coalition and National Association for State and Territory AIDS Directors. And we're in the middle of uh, organizing another series. Um, we've done two, one on data uh, collection best practices, one on, so you want to start a syringe exchange in Florida. Uh, and we've got two coming up uh, on Narcan and overdose recognition and reversal best practices. One for communities, bars, um, places like that, and another for law enforcement and first responders. And those will come up uh, mid and late November. Um, but we're also kind of interested in what do other folks want to see, you know, to Renee's point, maybe one on harm reduction language. You know, how do we start to change the narratives with person first language, with educating folks on the types of services that are out there that within the harm reduction realm and kind of demystifying them, um, you know, uh, maybe cultural competency for folks. Um, you know, that that is talked about a lot, um, you know, for folks uh, just because you you have your doors open uh, in different communities are walking in, whether they be trans or LGBTQ or Latinx or such, um, are you are you really offering services to those communities in a way that 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 
speaks to their community or are you just kind of offering services and they're accessing your program um but you know we're very interested in 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 spreading the message of course of harm reduction uh, across the state and breaking down silos as well silos between law enforcement behavioral health um you know just getting everybody talking and chatting um so you know any any training you want to put together we can work with our partners across the state and across the country and and, and do those um we just want to want folks to engage So I would like to, I, I could answer that question really quick. I would like to see like what Vanessa had mentioned earlier, um, you know, just some information on how it's worked in other areas. Um, that way we can get the message across in Florida that it does in fact work. Um, you know, just general basic information to start the training on what it is that the place is doing, but then, you know, the data that backs it up on its effectiveness. Something I could see maybe being helpful um, would be for things that can be changed at that local level of seeing what language um, uh, was actually in different bills or ordinances um, or, or county or municipal level regulations and kind of seeing how that can be shared. Um, because I think for a lot of folks, they might be aware that something changed in Miami and now they offer certain services that maybe the county they live in doesn't offer but to be able to actually see you know like what was the process how did that go through approvals what was the language and then if if some things can be kind of copy and pasted from one jurisdiction to another that could help accelerate um you know legal changes that way and and help folks not have to kind of reinvent the wheel of going through all those processes alone Oh, Tim, you're on mute, but you seem excited. Oh, I want to. Yes, that, he that, does that seem excited. That is that is our mission. We do not need 67 or more processes across the state of Florida. We we have uh, taken what's gone on already. We have a presentation about you know how we went through the steps so far in Duval County to get to an ordinance being presented to the commission. We have a sample commission, uh, a sample ordinance that has been cleared of all um, compromises. You know how politicians like to put a compromise in, and you know we've gone through the the ordinances and taken them out so that we have a clean document that then we can compromise later, as opposed to starting with a compromised document that gets more compromised later. Uh, we have sample contracts between county health departments and organizations that are operating syringe access programs, best practices training, harm reduction 101 training, everything so that nobody has to invent, reinvent the wheel. And, and in fact, one of our reasons for, for becoming a 501c3 was that we don't need 67 501c3s across the state. Um, running a not-for-profit is not easy. Um, and if every small organization that wants to do harm reduction, a Narcan program or a syringe access program, has to go out and get a 501c3, you've got 67 boards and 67 monthly meetings. And, and it's just, um, you know, it, it's in, in our goal as well is to, you know, do the da data sharing that Vanessa is talking about statewide, communicating across the lines. Um, county lines or, or managing entity lines or health region lines. If we're seeing a spike of overdoses in, in, in Ocala, we know that it's coming to, to Putnam County soon, or we know it's coming to Volusia. Uh, we, we've tracked overdoses in that way to, to see, you know, a few weeks ago, we had 17 overdoses in Lake County uh, within a weekend. And, and the next weekend, we had 10 in, in Volusia. Um, so we see the movement of that stuff and if we can communicate statewide as opposed to in our little silos we can we can really not reinvent the wheel every time we try to invent a wheel um thank you um we are at time but lynn had her hand raised so go ahead lynn i'll be very quick um i wanted to answer to tim that i think i would like information 
on the successes or the impact outside of the substance use field. So if you had cleaner parks and if you had reduced disease of other sorts and things that are off topic, so to speak, that um, everyone would benefit from, from certain people's perspectives. <laughs> That's all, thanks, Jordan. And he said, we have that. <laughs> well, I wanna give a big thank you to Kyle, Noah, and Renee. I'm gonna add Tim in there as well for sharing your expertise on the topic of harm reduction. Um, attendees, please use the link in the chat to complete the evaluation survey for the session. Thank you, Florida State University for managing the summit evaluations. And thank you all for participating and making this interactive discussion possible. I've learned so much. Um, please go to your summit program PDF or visit the pathforhope.com forward slash summit 2021 and click on the link for today's plenary session at 1240. Um, and then I'm now going to end the meeting. I hope you guys all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all so much for making this space and inviting us. It's been a really fabulous conversation. Take care, everyone.